Um, thank you for having me drop into your meeting to talk a little bit about some of my favorite plants in the world. Um, I enjoy cacti and succulents. Cacti in particular, I got started with because I was able to travel and see them in their habitat. There's lots of interesting plants near Albuquerque and within a day or two's drive. And I enjoy the outdoors. So it all sort of went together. I'm going to start here by sharing my my talk and I think that should do it. Can everyone see that? Particularly Sarah. Okay. So as Sarah said, I'm going to talk about plants from southeastern New Mexico and northwestern New Mexico. And some people may go, Hey, what about all the rest of the New Mexico and so forth? As Sari indicated, there are way too many different interesting plants to show, even if I went into machine gun format, you know, a picture every 10 seconds. Uh, I really don't like talks like that. Um, an example of something that I'm omitting entirely are papuntias, prickly pears, choyas, crown choyas, et cetera. If you want to find about, out about that very interesting group of cactus, you'll have to talk to Dave Ferguson. Uh, he just retired from the Botanic Garden here recently, and he probably knows more about Apuntias than anybody else is interested in hearing. Uh, he's a great guy, and I have had a lot of fun traveling with him on occasion. Uh, part of the why is I enjoy seeing plants in, in habitat. And I thought that your group would probably be more interested in seeing plants in habitat and have some idea where they came from and so forth um, than just seeing plants lined up in pots. However, with this limitation of just two sections of New Mexico, and excluding the put is almost entirely, um, there are still plenty of slides. Various people have indicated that it would be useful to talk a little bit about propagation. And so I'll do that as the talk goes on. Some New Mexico cacti are easy to grow while some are extremely difficult. And I think you'll be able to see for yourself which are the easy ones and which are the difficult ones. And I'll try and comment too. Echinocerius and Escobaria are very easy to grow. And I'll show you a picture of an Echinocerius here in a second. Uh, some of the plants that I am interested in, for example, sclerocactus can be very difficult to grow. And as I said before, I will comment as I go through the presentation about, no, you can't grow this, or this is really easy to grow or whatever. And there's a lot of information at the New Mexico Cactus Society website about growing all sorts of things. There's a specific page with lots of links to, you know, how to grow um, mesms from South Africa or how to grow plants in small containers and so on and so forth. So I encourage you to go there if you have questions. And after you've looked at all of that or looked at some of it and got confused, um, send us an email. We'll be happy to try and answer your questions via email. Uh, the Cactus Society's email address is on the main page. Here's an example of something that's very easy to grow, a kind of serious. Um, in particular, this one is a cutting that I took from a plant near Oro Grande, which is a place we'll be talking about here in a couple of dozen slides. Uh, so a kind of serious of all sorts are interesting. It turns out that there's a bunch of them that have red flowers that grow around us that hummingbirds really love. My wife and I both enjoy seeing hummingbirds. And so I have a number of plants in my front yard that are hummingbird bait. And it appears that the hummingbirds show up about the time these guys start flowering. Uh, as Sarah said, I grow lots of things from seed. Here's an example of some 
some stuff in the greenhouse. These are all cold hardy, but uh, I keep them under a plastic roof so that I can control when they get water. Uh, I also grow other strange things like lithops. I've gotten interested in them because they bloom in the fall. I have a bunch of them blooming in my greenhouse right now. And there aren't that many things in the land of cacti and succulents that bloom in the fall. And you can see some are very strange. This one up here is sort of a wine red plant. So moving on, our first section of this talk will be a trip that I and Stephen Brack and Alan Gilmore took, uh, shoot, it's been two, two years ago from Albuquerque uh, down to Carrizoso and Alamogordo, Oro Grande, White Sands, and then made the loop back home. And we did this in the spring when we thought we'd see lots of plants blooming. Um, Oro Grande is an interesting place because there's a lot of hybridization going on there. And the plant I showed you in my front yard is an example of one of those hybrids. They have interesting flower colors and the spination sort of interesting. One place you might not think of to stop at is Valley of Fires east of Carrizoso. Uh, here's Stephen Brack and Alan Gilmore. Alan Gilmore has had a lot of interest oops, in this hybrid swarm near Oro Grande, and he many times goes and visits there with a long knife and a paper bag and takes cuttings. Um, I doubt that he harms the actual plants. If you're taking one stem off of a plant with a dozen stems, the plant is going to survive taking the cutting. This is an example of those red flowered, um, a kind of cereus that hummingbirds like. This is coccinius. It's growing here in the uh, lava flow. We happen to catch them just at the start of their flower in this season. Uh, you'll see this sort of plant around Albuquerque and a little ways north. Coccinius, the species, tends to be um, a southern New Mexico kind of plant with a lot of variability. Here's another one blooming. Uh, we see a choya, Opentia imbricata, the plant you see around Albuquerque there in the background. There are other interesting things. Yucca poacata was growing out in the lava flow. That's the yucca that you see around Albuquerque in the lower foothills. I'm pretty sure it's Picata because the flower stalk is not getting much taller than the leaves. Some sorts of yuccas that you've seen in Albuquerque that come from other places, of course, have flower stalks that stick way up above the leaf rosette. Um, and of course, they had uh, Sotol or Desilarian Wheeler Eye. And those are grown quite often in the Albuquerque area. I have a big multi-stem plant in my front yard that I grew from a little offset that I planted years ago. One of the places we were interested in going to was Dog Canyon at Oliver Lee State Park. It's a very pretty area. It's just a little bit south of Alamogordo. Um, there are lots of things growing there. And it turns out the trail, I'll show you some pictures here in a little bit. The trail is very easy to walk. Uh, we have Okatia, which again does well in uh, Albuquerque. I have two big ones in my front yard that have been there for 30 years. I live up in the Heights, more or less Tramway and Manal. Um, the proper botanical name is Picaria splendens. Um, we also have a bunch of a uh, new species of a kind of cereus called Strominius, and they tend to make these big haystacks, I'll call them, or hay piles. They have pretty flowers. They weren't quite blooming. I think I have a picture of a flower or two later, you know, the very earliest flowers. And as I, as I said, the, the scenery there is spectacular, which is part of the reason I enjoy going out looking at cacti and habitat. We have a bunch of the kind of serious strominius, some prickly pears, opuntias of various sorts. Uh, looks like we have an okatea up here on the side hill. 
It's a really neat place. And the penstemon were started, starting to bloom. I'm not sure which penstemon, excuse me, that is. I would imagine somebody in your group knows what it is. Uh, one of the reasons to go to Dog Canyon is um, Escobaria velardii grows there. And it seems like that each of the little I mountain islands in southern New Mexico, like the mountains around uh, Alamogordo or the Hatchet Mountains off to the southwest, and there's about a half a dozen of these different mountain groups that are isolated from each other by desert. They each have a different Escobaria on growing in them. I can think of a couple of names, Orcutii, Conigii, uh, Lei, which grows over by uh, Carlsbad Caverns. Uh, they all are very easy to grow in pots. And I have some, some of these plants growing outdoors in my yard. It may need a little bit of protection if it goes to 15 below again. But at most winters, I pay no attention and they bloom beautifully in the spring. Uh, here's the trail going up Dog Canyon. And you can see it's you know, a nice gravel trail that many people could hike and look at interesting country. Another plant we saw there was a kind of cactus horizontalonius. Some people call it the blue barrel. It has really nice mm, fluorescent pink flowers and it blooms several times during the summer. Unfortunately, we were a little bit early for it to be blooming. Um, and glandular cactus ridei, it's getting ready to bloom. It has really dark red flowers with a bit of striping along the petals. Those things are usually hard to find because they're small and they're in the grass. Some other things, Epithalantha micromeris, um, what you're seeing here are, the red thing is a fruit with a few seeds in it. And look at these magnificently huge pink flowers. You don't grow this plant because it's um, for the flowers, you grow it for the, the curiosity of the plant. And you can see it's a little plant and it tends to like to grow in the rocks. Most of the plants from Dog Canyon can be grown in Albuquerque. You may need to provide them a little bit of protection. Actually, Epithalantha micromeris comes as far north as uh, those uh, mountains or hills or whatever you want to call them that are straight west of Berlin. There are plants growing in there. Angela cactus ridei were at the northern edge of its uh, area. And uh, I doubt that you can grow it in Albuquerque out of doors. Bamblasia acanthus is another interesting plant. It has really interesting um, flowers that have a pink midstripe on a off-white petal. Unfortunately, it wasn't blooming, but we weren't there to see those guys. You'll see why we were why we chose the time we did in just a few minutes. Amelaria gramii. It's probably it and Lazia cantha probably would not survive out of doors here in Albuquerque unless you provided some extra protection. This guy will survive out of doors here, Echinocereus stasia canthus. These guys almost always have yellow flowers. They can get to be big clumps. I've grown them in my front yard for years. The major reason we left for southeastern New Mexico at the time we did was to go see the hybrids, which were blooming. The hybrid is a hybrid between coccinius, which was a plant with a red flower that I showed you in the lava flow, and they grow lots of other places too, and Dazzy acanthus, the plant that had the yellow flower. And it's a big hybrid swarm that covers many square miles west of Oro Grande. And as you might imagine, there's lots of mixing so that you'll see plants that look more like one parent than the other and vice versa. And I'll show you some examples of that. There are two other species of cactus that are mixing in a little bit. So you have all sorts of interesting color flowers. And I'm gonna sort of go in machine gun mode here. Uh, Sarah, if you would 
yell at me when the, I'm at 45 minutes, I'd appreciate it because I've just discovered I don't have a watch on me. Uh, so you have sort of a dark pink, a light pink, orange. This one looks a little bit more like Dazzy Acanthus to me, if you look at the spination. Uh, here's another orange peach. Um, this is the a third species down there, making a series chloranthus. And it looks like it may have a little bit of uh, some genes from other plants because it looks odd to me. Whatever that's worth. Here's something that looks a lot more like an Echinocereus toxinius. These are all growing within, oh, I don't know, a quarter, uh, a quarter of a square mile, something like that. Here's something that's more Dazzy acanthus looking. If you count the number of ribs it has on it, it has fewer rib, ribs than normal Dazzy acanthus. And Dazzy acanthus never has this beautiful rose flower. Here's something that's a little more like coccinius. We're back to peach flowers. A pretty uh, almost color purple flower. I have a lavender flowered plant in my front yard that was taken from a cutting here. Pale pink. Nice. Another nice pink. Another pale pink. Uh, here's Echinocereus strominius. I don't think it's involved in the hybridization there west of Oro Grande. You can see it's got the very typical looking hay pile and it's got a purple flower. Unfortunately, the flower wasn't open. It's a very pretty plant. I haven't tried to grow in Strominius in Albuquerque and I don't know of anybody that has tried to grow it. All of those hybrids that we were just looking at grow perfectly well. In fact, Alan Gilmore has a side yard that's full of several hundred cuttings that are rooted and growing and flowering. So here's another Mamamaria hydri. It tends to stay flat with the ground. It has little white flowers that are, you see the flower buds here, and then later in the season, it'll have um, red fruits. And the animals enjoy the red fruits. All these plants are on more or less a single hill that we were wandering around. Four pinks. Uh, here's a sort of a bright pink. You can see the spot, spination looks different than the previous plant. It's more Dazzy Acanthus looking. Here's a very interesting flower, at least for me. It's sort of a, I don't know, a peachy pink flower with the white throat makes it a very striking flower. Here's a plant from the same area that looks more like standard issue Dazzy acanthus. How it's escaped being affected by everybody else, I don't know. Or maybe it's just got a little bit of everything else in it. Uh, we happen to see an Echinocereus fenleri, which is another Echinocereus that's growing in the same area. I've seen a, they aren't very common, and I've seen a few of them that have hybridized where they look funny, shall we say. So I'm guessing they've hybridized. There's another hybrid that grows in the Fort Stockton area that's called Moidii that has all sorts of interesting flower colors. And it's a similar sort of hybrid between a different coccinius variety and Dazzy acanthus. So there we go, it's another hybrid of some sort. Looks a little more Dazzy Acanthus like. Here's uh, two plants sitting side by side, and you can see the color variation. It's not just my camera that's doing it. We wandered off to White Sands National Monument afterwards because there's a very interesting Trigla kidiatus, Echinocereus Trigla kidiatus, growing in the area. And the reason it's interesting is. At least to me, it gets huge. I have seen plants that are 
at least 18 inches tall. The stems are 18 inches tall. This is an example of one. And they tend to grow in the grass, surfing in front of the dunes at White Sands. Tomea papricantha, which I'll show you pictures of later, also grows down here. But we didn't find any tomatoes when we were there. You can see how huge they get. I've got some plants from uh, someone I purchased from someone in my front yard, and they are really growing quickly. I think this is a real uh, selection that's different than the Triglyph idiotis that grows around Albuquerque. So after visiting White Sands and Oro Grande and, and so on, we headed off toward Las Cruces. And as we were driving down the four lane highway, we saw all these bright red spots out in the uh, desert. And they were acting a serious coccinius bloom. I mean, who would love to have something like that blooming in their front yard for two or three weeks every spring to bring the hummingbirds in? By the way, as a side pitch, we sell lots of these plants at our spring show and sale. So come visit us. There's a different, slightly different looking Echinocereus coccinius and then the spine in it. So after going through Las Cruces, we headed back north up the interstate and somewhere between Socorro and TRC, there's a stop we like to make at an exit called Red Rocks. Again, it's very fine looking farmland, which is where all the cactus grow. We can all smile now. And the reason we were stopping there is this is the furthest north any of us have seen this kind of serious. Chrysanthus, which has sort of interesting coppery flowers that don't ever open that widely. But the spination is just amazing. I enjoy the dark red spines intermixed with the white. It's a very striking yard plant. I have grown these in my yard. They're a little bit touchy. They, as you, can, as you might imagine from where they're growing, they don't like to stay very wet. And if we get a really wet summer monsoon, which happens once in a while, they're not very happy with it. We also saw coccinius there. So Echinocereus coccinius is sort of everywhere. So I'll move on to the second part of my talk now. What's my time, Sarah? I have lost track of time. Uh, you're doing great. You've gone um, barely a half hour. Okay. So we'll get this done and have time for some questions. Okay. I think maybe it was in 2018. Of course, we didn't do anything in 20. Um, Steve Brack and a fellow by the name of Al Lappin and Steve Brack's wife, Linda, and I made this loop. And what I'm going to talk about is the chunk from Albuquerque to the Farmington area. And we, what we did was we drove up to Farmington one day, and then we rented a house there through Airbnb and spent a couple of days just making trips out from Farmington because there's lots of interesting things to see around Farmington, including a very famous uh, endangered species, Pedionoltenon. So one of the first places we stopped was at San Ysidro. Oh, good grief. Hang on. Uh, this is Sarah, and I'll just say this is one that Jim McGrath took a field trip with some of us to go up there near San Isidro and look for this um, common name, uh, grandma grass cactus, I, I guess, think. Yes. That's, <laughs> that, if you were looking for something that was sort of the size of the last joint or two of your thumb, that's what you were looking for. And they're fairly common, well, not fairly common. If they're in flower, they appear to be fairly common. If they're not in flower, they are very difficult to find, as you might imagine. 
And so we were up there to see what they were doing. They weren't quite flowering. And there are lots of other interesting things to look at a little bit west of San Ysidro. There were some big Sclerocactus parviflorus, and as luck would have it, this one was done blooming. And other interesting things too, we were climbing around on the uh, hills a little north of 550. This is Echinocerius triglycidiatus, which looks very, very similar to Coccinius. And the reason there are two different species is one's diploid and one's tetraploid. There are other things that help you understand that they're different. Uh, Triglycidiatus always sets seed and very easily. Coccinius has a tough time setting seed. Coccinius sometimes has plants that have only male flowers or only female flowers. Those sorts of things don't happen with Triglycidiatus. This is the same species as that monster I was showing you down at White Sands. Just a different form, individual, whatever. They were blooming. And so where's the tiny Timea? This is probably a year old seed, well, two year old seedling. If it were in my greenhouse, I would expect the plant to be that old, that big after two years. These are tiny plants, they never get very big. I mean, a big plant in the field or the biggest plant I've ever seen in the field is sort of like the last three joints of my thumb, the size of my thumb. And this plant has been suggested as a threatened species in New Mexico. And while I pl applaud the interest in the plant, this plant can be found many, many places in New Mexico, ranging all the way from uh, north of Santa Fe, they're around, they're around Los Alamos, and they're over at Grants, they're in the Albuquerque area, uh, they're out at Klein's Corners that I know of, uh, they're down in the Alabagordo area, uh, they've been found at Sevilleta, um, they also make it across the border into Texas. I've seen them in Texas, a little south of the border. And I saw a recent report that they were down in Chihuahua, Mexico. I think the reason people think that they're threatened or something is they're really hard to see unless they're flowering. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. Here's a tiny sclerocactus parviflorus. We saw Mama, the big the one with the big purple flowers, just a moment ago. There are other things there, a kind of serious Fenleri. And we wandered off a couple hundred yards and we found some a big flat area, deep soils, and the Triglycidiotis were growing there. This is Al Lappin and that steep rack over there. We wandered around. We've known this place as a place with big plants for many years. And it's fun to go back and see what's going on, how they're doing. And so we made stops as we roared up the road to Farmington. This is near Cuba, and you can see the spinations a little bit different on this particular individual. We're near Cuba now. And as we popped over the uh, Continental Divide into um, the drainage for the Farmington area. There's a new sclerocactus that shows up, sclerocactus globeri. And it's a fairly common plant, and I'm going to plague you with pictures of plants from a variety of places. Uh, these guys enjoy uh, really nice soils. Well, not really. They enjoy mostly heavy clay soils. Here's another trig at the same place near Lybrook. Give you an idea where we are. We're all halfway between the Continental Divide and uh, Bloomfield. Here's a clover A that's getting ready to bloom, and the plant body there is probably, oh, maybe ping pong ball size. Most of them are small plants. 
and they grow in this terrible clay. And here we have Steve and Linda Brack looking at something in a very promising looking site. I doubt that many of you would think of looking for cactus here. And what are they looking for? They're looking for Sclerocactus clover A variety brachii, which is the real miniature of this clover A, clover A group. And you can see it's spring and it's got enough moisture, it's just breaking through the soil. This particular variety has a reputation for say, staying extremely small. I mean, a ping pong ball size plant would be considered huge. You know, we're at the same place. This is a little bit a, a big plant right here. This is just a little bit south of Bloomfield. So we've rocketed across the Albuquerque to Farmington, spent the night, and the next day we decided to go wandering around southeast of Farmington to look at what we could see. And in fact, we took a trip from here near to Gizi all the way up to the river. There's a something called Canyon Largo, which is very pretty uh, landscape. We didn't see that many cactus until, except at either end, essentially. Or sclera cactus clover growing in this wonderful soil. I have some with some pictures of uh, flowers here in a little bit. So if you're roaring down the road to Farmington, you can find the most awful looking habitat you can. This clay and go look for plants if you're interested. There's a group of plants. I'd, I'd assume what happened was mama produced lots of seed and died. And these are some of the seedlings that came up around the base of the parent plant. The next day, after wandering around and seeing lots of things, we went west of Farmington. And we were interested in looking at Sclerocactus mesa verde, which is an endangered species. And well, first we had to look at some Sclerocactus clover A because they're sort of everywhere. Here they're growing in sort of an alluvial hillside. You can see how dark purple the flowers can be. This is a plant getting ready to bloom. It was early in the morning, so the flowers weren't open. There's a little guy nearby. Or lots of plants on this side hill. Also, Escobaria vivipara, which I don't think I've mentioned, that's a very common plant. Makes a great yard plant. This one's unusual in that it must have had the tip of the stem clipped off and then it went nuts offsetting. They have beautiful rings of purple flowers when they're blooming in the spring. Ah, uh, Sclerocactus mesa verde, the endangered, one of the endangered species from Northwest New Mexico. You'll see again, it's growing in really nice looking habitat, ha uh -huh. We stopped. They come close to Farmington. This is the hogback that's west of Farmington off in the distance. And you can see there's almost nothing growing here. There's some shrubs brush that hasn't even started greening up in the spring. But the scleros are starting to grow. This is a little seedling that's waking up and coming out of its hole. The little guys can go underground to try and survive. This is another site. And sorry, I'm going to get on my soapbox again here for a little bit. People get excited and say things like, oh, that site doesn't have any of this particular cactus or that because the evil cactus growers went in and, or cactus collectors went in and collected everything out of the site. That's almost never the case. This is an example where it was a place that had hundreds, maybe thousands of square cactus mesa verde 20 years ago. And the owners of the land, in this case, the Navajos, decided that they needed to 
overgrazed the hell out of it. There wasn't much to graze there in the beginning. And we had, did not seen, uh, see a single sclera cactus mesa verde there. We saw one or two parvies that were deep in bushes which protected them from the cattle or horses or whatever. And I don't think it was a, another thing that kills sclerocactus in particular and mesa verdes too, scleral mesa verde, they are bugs. They get a bore in them that will kill them. It's sort of a cyclic thing. You get a dense population of sclerocactus, the bugs will move in, they'll kill almost all of the plants, and then the bugs will die or move on or whatever. And then plants will come up from the seed bank that's in the ground. If the plants have been numerous in there for lots of years, uh, there's a lot of seeds in the soil and the seeds will last 20, 30 years. I know that to be a fact because I've germinated seed that's 20 plus years old. So if someone would stop grazing cattle here and churning the countryside up, the Mesa Verdes would probably come back in 20 or 30 years. I've seen this sort of thing happen with other scleral cactus species in Nevada and in Utah, Parvophorus in Utah and Sclerocactus polyancistris in Nevada. The bugs came and cleared them out. And then 15 years later, their plants were back and looking healthy until the next bug infestation. In this case, the bugs are large and they're bovine. So we went nearby, oh, a mile down the road to another place that hadn't been grazed because there's nothing to graze. There wasn't any indication of hoof prints or other churning. And we saw some happy sclerocactus. And you can see it's a really small place to be grazing cattle, which even the locals don't do because there's nothing there for them to eat. And Steve Brack is looking at a sclerocactus that's roughly there. That's obvious to everyone. And I think he was looking at this guy. This Mesa Verde has hook spines on it. Very few. Mesa Verdes have hook spines. I don't know if it's a regressive trait or there's a little bit of gene exchange with the nearby parvoflorus. And so we wandered off to the south of Ship Rock and took the road that goes across south of the San Juan River and made a couple of stops at likely looking places and saw more sclera cactus Mesa Verde. And in fact, in some places we saw lots of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There may be more. But they were happy. And you'll notice that there isn't any sign of cattle or horses or anything else turning up the countryside. So they're OK. These plants take a quite a while to grow from a seedling to a plant that's modest size that will produce seed to replace itself at least five years, probably more like 10 under the conditions you see in Northwest New Mexico. So we went Northeast of Farmington, which you'll enjoy because Pedionoltonai grows up there. In fact, Pedionoltonai grows up here sort of on the Colorado New Mexico line. I think if you were a major league pitcher, you could probably throw a baseball from the Noltoni Hill to Colorado. And here's Pediococcus Noltoni. Most of the plants that I see on the only hill where they grow are marble sized or a little bit bigger. And they literally do grow on only one hill that's a couple of football fields in size. Why that's the case, I'm not sure. Various people have suggested various things. Uh, the plants turn out to be relatively easy to grow. I've grown many from seed over the years and have produced tons of seed in my greenhouse. And I probably need to plant some more seed to replace the old plants that are may not be with me for many more years. Many of these plants have lifetimes of oh, 10 to 20 years. Some of my plants are older than that. This year was a kind of a dry year, and we see only one of these plants. There, this is probably a circle of five plants, not one plant with multiple stems. That particular plant bloomed and made a few seeds. 
Here's some more. They all appear relatively happy at this point. We had gotten some rain the week before. And this is a look at the habitat, which doesn't look that unusual. It's a gravelly hillside next to a river. And as one might imagine, the fish and wildlife people are keeping an eye on some of the plants and their tags scattered here and there with numbers on them. And the reason they put tags on is uh, they're hard to find. I know there's at least two plants inside that bush. Here's a little closer view of a different bush and you can see two plants right there. And they're marble size and hard to find. If you catch them in flower, it makes a lot of difference. So we wandered around the hill, looked at the plants, and they seem to be happy. We also saw some nice Escobaria vivipara. Here's one that has to have the top clipped, and it's looking fairly normal. Making a serious femori, which is a beautiful purple flower. It's a great yard plant. It doesn't ever get big like some of the other echinocerias we've looked at. There's a nice dark purple flower. And so on the way back into Farmington for the evening and dinner and maybe even a cold beverage, we stopped at a hill we knew of near Navajo Lake. It's not far from the dam. And you can see the squirrel clover were in bloom. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. And I'm sure there are more in the, in the grass. There's maybe another one, seven. Uh, that are don't have flowers open, so you can't see them easily from this picture. They have nice flowers. These might make yard plants if you had a place where you can make sure that they were well drained. And maybe even if we get heavy summer rains, you might have to put a temporary roof over them to keep the excess rain off of them. We haven't had that problem recently in Albuquerque. This year was kind of wet, at least at my house, but. They're nice plants. Here's more from that same hillside. Some of them are really big, were really big plants. I told you they were baseball size or smaller. Once in a while, the bugs don't get to them and they're happy and they get even bigger than that. Ah, another place we stopped on the way back into Farmington that evening was this very likely looking spot. One could imagine growing corn here, right? I'm kidding. There's a sclerocactus clover growing in the middle of this mess. We saw probably a dozen plants growing in this mess next to the highway near Aztec. These are all sclerocloverae. clover. So at this point, I quit. This is a sample of what grows in New Mexico. Thank you for your attention. And I'm sure I've skipped over many things that are obvious to me and not to you. So please, questions. Well, and, and Ralph, thank you. And actually, you just reached the 45 minute mark. So Good. we we can take some time here if, if we want to with um, discussion around the questions. And one question that came up right away was um, the season that you went um, on these trips. In other words, when is a good season or time of year to go south and when to go to the northwest to see the bloom? Mid-April mid -April is a good time to go to the southeast or to the south in general. There's lots of other things to see around Las Cruces, around Carlsbad. Um, a plant called a kind of cactus Texensis, the Texas horse scribbler, grows around Carlsbad, and that's a really amazing plant. It can be the size of a dish. The, things in the south tend to bloom in the middle of April, plus or minus two weeks, as you well know, New Mexico weather. And if you're going to the northwest and you're looking for things like sclerocactus and these other plants, the first of May is a nice time to think about it. Maybe you'll be there a little early and maybe you'll be there slightly late, but you'll probably see something somewhere. Great, 
And um, an, another person asked, uh, said that they live east of Albuquerque in Edge, the Edgewood area at 6,800 feet. And do you have any particular cacti that you would recommend growing at that altitude? Um, a plant that does grow around them at Edgewood, a kind of serious Feritiflorus, it has a green flower and it has, uh, the flowers are lemon scented, is a very nice. Um, the kind of serious Triglycidiotis and Coccinius, the red flowering ones would be good plants to try. Escobaria vivipara, which I showed that big clump, those things grow up on top of South Peak. So they're plenty cold hardy. And I think if you go to our website, there may be a, a listing of things that do well in Albuquerque. And if you pick the ones that are a little bit more cold hardy or send us an email, we can help out too. I don't know that any of the South African mesons will do well there. Delisperm is mine. Great, thank you. And then um, I, I, this one came in to me, um, no bees visiting um, weren't, were, were shown in the picture, but um, the person is wondering that if the bees or pollinators are the reason for the hybrids in Oro Grande or anywhere. Hybridization is really quite rare. I should have made that clear. I mean, the only place I know that there's a big hybrid swarm is down there at Oro Grande and also in the Fort Stockton area and further south toward Big Bend, kind of. And I would guess that there was an overlap in flowering time and the bees almost certainly are the pollinators for these plants. Um, I didn't happen to catch a bee in any of the flowers that I showed you. Uh, there are lots of things that the flowering times don't overlap. And so you don't see hybrids. I know, for example, that scleroclovery and lots of sclerocactus, the things with hook spines, uh, will cross pollen, will hybridize with Tamea papricantha, the little guy that was sort of thumb sized and smaller. And I have fourth or fifth generation hybrids growing in my greenhouse. So it's not a question that the offspring of that first cross are sterile or that they can't even make the seed. Uh, in a greenhouse, I can make seed and the offspring and the, you know, the grandchildren and the great grandchildren can continue to uh, produce viable seed. And in fact, I've even crossed some of the hybrids back with Tumea to make something that's, you know, sort of three quarters Tumea rather than half Tumea. And those guys are, are happy. I can make seed from them and grow multiple generations of those things. So I probably more than answered your question then, or not. <laughs> Is there a follow-up question to that, Janet? You can just unmute and say it if you want to. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you very much. And I imagine it's all native bees as well in those areas. I would guess almost certainly it's native bees. I mean, the places where these things grow rarely are around cultivated farmland sorts of situations. Thank That's you. not always the case, but Usually it is. And, and Ralph, I kind of had a related question um, myself that, you know, that was an interesting story about the seed germinating after 25 or 30 years. And I just wondered if in the, these 40 years of traveling around New Mexico and looking at cacti, um, you know, wh how do you assess the general population? Is it healthy? Um, are there enough pollinators? Are you seeing plants migrate to the north? Um, you know, just any changes like that that you're noticing? It's very hard to talk about or for me to understand if there are general things going on like they're moving north. I would guess not. The thing that really affects whether or not the plants are doing well 
is what's happening to their habitat. I showed you the Mesa Verde site where uh, someone had run a bunch of horses and cattle in there for no apparent reason because there's nothing to graze. And it churned up and killed. Well, I mean, all you have to do is kill the seedlings for a couple of years in a row. And then pretty soon all you have is old plants or and maybe you kill the old ones too. I mean, the plants are not so big that a cow stepping on it wouldn't kill it. So it's mostly it's habitat degradation of some sort. I mean, long years ago when I moved into my house at, call it uh, Tramway and Manal, there were a number of Tumea populations around me. There was also uh, Mammillaria ridei and some other things. And those areas are now covered by houses or apartment buildings or something. So that's a bit of a problem too. At least for me, I can't go out and look at those interesting plants. I can go up into the green space a little further uh, to the east. But I haven't seen tomatoes up there. It's, you know, the habitat has changed. 